Magician's Niece presents Sinisterhood by Helena Marie Chandler. Music by Adrian Romero. Chapter 39 The Dove. Sunday, the 15th of August, 1971. Got a phone call from Victoria today first one in over a year. She has decided to send Dawn to a boarding school and has chosen a place close to where Nigel and I are living. Apparently it has a very good reputation for children with Dawn's condition. She didn't hesitate to let me know how expensive it was going to be. Typical. Vic says that the move is for the good of Dawn as she's finding bringing up her daughter almost impossible. Four is very, very young though. What goes on in their house is a mystery to me, but it seems like they've got the money and the comfort. I can't understand why they don't just buy and help. Couldn't they send her to the local special school as a day girl? Of course, I haven't spoken to G in years, but I very much doubt he's on board with this plan. He's such a loving person. I'm sure his little dawn is very precious to him. Sometimes I wish I could contact him stand up for him, but I gave up daring to poke my nose into their relationship many years ago. That horrible act of theft still haunts me. Victoria asked me if I would mind being guardian to Dawn. I don't know how I feel about this request. Is Victoria finally trying to build a bridge after so many years of turmoil? I don't doubt that the little one will be better off in the care of trained professionals, and I wish no ill will to her at all, but I'm finding myself questioning whether I owe anything of myself to my unfortunate bitch of a sister. Since our last heated argument at Christmas, 70, I have found myself wondering how our relationship ever got so strained. She seems to have conveniently forgotten who was Geoffrey's first fiancé. She still breezes through life as if she's done absolutely nothing at all wrong. I find it so upsetting that G and I never got to be together. Nigel and I have had a lot of fun, but enough's enough. I want my own children, thank you very much, and he's most certainly not going to give me any. I used to hold the incident with Victoria so much against Geoffrey, wondering just how he could have ever got himself into such a situation. Why didn't he stand up for me? Why didn't he stand up for himself? Now I just feel very sorry for him but I'm finding my life speeding past at the moment and I don't want to be a bystander anymore. Victoria has never been a bystander. What Victoria wants, Victoria has always got. And she wanted Geoffrey and now she's got him and all his money and all his sweetness and generosity. She can really twist anything, that snake. I still can't work out though how she ever got this way. In my experience as a teacher, I've never found that children are bad or good by nature. I do wonder sometimes if mummy and daddy treated her differently to me, or if there was a lack of affection for her in the home. There was a big age gap between us, but when I was growing up, my parents were always so loving and I was always very happy. I never really noticed at that age what was going on with Vic. When I see very bad behaviour in the classroom, I often notice that there has been neglect in the home, especially before the age of eight. She was much younger than me, and I was always out and about, so busy with my big circle of friends that I don't think I noticed anything untoward. That strange comment, though, it's always stuck with me. The one mummy accidentally dropped at Christmas time one year to her bosom friend after she'd had a few too many sherries. I wasn't supposed to hear it, but I did. The terrible truth, that Victoria was the product of rape. Was it true, though? I can't imagine Daddy ever being anything more than docile in the bedroom. It was always Mummy who wore the trousers in our house. Perhaps it could have been an affair or an attacker. We have always looked so different, Victoria and me. So much so that it was laughed at during our childhood. A joke. Something always blamed on the window cleaner. But was it ever true? Whether she was the product of a loving relationship or not, I do wonder sometimes if Victoria was ever told this fact. 
if it ever came out at the peak of a heated row, for example, or in a blind rage. Perhaps it was merely in living up to the revelation that she did what she did to Geoffrey. One always has one's own guilt, of course, and I do sometimes think that perhaps I somehow caused problems for Victoria simply by my very existence in the home. But didn't she cause just as many problems for me? I was always so well behaved, such a goody two-shoes as a little girl. And the number of times I had to hide in the cupboard when Mummy and Victoria were at it. Her temper was really quite terrifying sometimes. Mummy just didn't have the wherewithal to properly discipline her. She never reported half of the horrors to Daddy when he came home from work. I'm sure she would have felt like a failure if she had. In any case, Victoria had developed such strange and powerful wiles with men so early in her life that she could wrap Daddy well and truly round her little finger. I remember her at around four, barely able to communicate, when she dressed like a princess and blushed enormously at Daddy's good-looking business partner who'd come round for tea. Little girls always dress like princesses, of course, but Victoria was most definitely flirting with him. And then there was all the cheating and duplicitousness, just to curry favour. Quite sad, really, that she resorted to such tactics. There was the time about 15 years ago when Victoria had entered a Battenberg into the village fate. In front of everyone, she was disqualified because she'd just unwrapped a shop-bought one and re-wrapped it in greaseproof paper. Mummy was mortified and didn't go to the golf club for months afterwards. But I don't know. There must be more to Victoria's badness than mere superficial acts. Something must have gone fundamentally wrong with my family for her to turn out the way she did. I must just have never realised. tried to keep in shape. A paunch had slyly been rising and angrily knocked back down by thousands of furious sit-ups over the course of the last ten years. It had occurred to him, however, last July, that this gradual growth of his girth wasn't necessarily a bad thing, because it could, in fact, be turned into a brilliant opportunity. Every cloud has a silver lining, he would say to himself as he stroked his paunch in front of the mirror. Or was it make lemonade out of lemons? He couldn't quite remember. But whatever, with all this time on his hands unemployed, Derek resolved to make the very best out of his large and rippling stomach. Derek would join a gym, the most expensive and exclusive gym he could possibly afford in the London area. Derek had spent a good few months in research, whiling away his long and free hours in the ascertaining of which area of the city had the highest percentage of idle, wealthy women over the age of at least 40. So well prepared was he that he laughed at the thought that he could go into business as a consultant to upmarket boutiques catering to the well-heeled middle-aged female, informing companies where best to set up shop. Too far west and the single women were far too young. Too far north and they were too foreign. Chelsea and Knightsbridge, though, A good hour on the tube from his present studio flat was where the plumpest birds, ripe for roasting, were to be easily found. Derek's application for membership to the borough's premier fitness studio was accepted. He was very proud of himself. Even Princess Diana was a member of this venerable place. Derek had had the foresight to polish up his smile by having some rather expensive dental work done at a private clinic on Harley Street before he made his first appearance. The dentist, sadly happily married, was quite a gorgeous blonde. After a good deal of mildly flirtatious conversation, the lady agreed to be Derek's character referee on the gymnasium application form. Derek had popped into Harrods to buy himself some designer workout gear. He was, of course, horrified at the cost, but coughed up nonetheless, considering the potential long-term benefits. It's an investment, Derek said to himself. It'll all pay dividends in the end. Indeed, 
The first windfall had come quite quickly, in the form of an invitation to a high-class charity do. Derek had got quite chatty with a bubbly middle-aged lady, upon whose beehive he had kindly remarked, and she had responded with a call to arms. Apparently Princess Di was on the board of trustees of the charity in question with this lady, and the tattler was to take the photographs. Unfortunately, it was an AIDS charity. And as a raging heterosexual, Derek found himself uncomfortable with the idea. But he knew philanthropists were mostly bored housewives and widows with too much money on their hands, so needs must was his immediate and altogether prevailing thought. He accepted the invitation. The Lawrence Garvey AIDS Memorial Dinner was held at Draper's Hall in the City of London the following Friday night. Who was to be sitting at Derek's table other than the rascal Nigel Dunleavy himself? Why should Derek be surprised? The dining room was filled with only women and homosexuals. Had the lady at the gym mistaken him for a gay? The thought made him feel physically sick. He nearly choked on his prawn cocktail. Derek? said Nigel, bluntly, refusing to hold out his hand. Never took you to be the charitable type. I was invited by a friend. A female friend? A friend whose friend died of AIDS. As of many of mine. Derek didn't respond. He felt the words home-cooked soup nearly spill out of his mouth. But he clenched his teeth and he gave a freshly glistening smile and he asked how Nigel was doing after the sad news about his ex-wife, Kira. I'm glad I've seen you, Derek, because I want you to know that I know what you're doing. Mr Crowther has told me that you keep pestering him about the house. You should know that he's considering sending you a letter to cease and desist. Let him. I was the most recent of Kira's husband. I have as much right over the house as you. I bought the fucking thing said Nigel, tearing a chunk of bread between his teeth, and I happily gave it to her in exchange for the fifteen lovely years we spent together. Small beer. Well, that's okay. You're an overpaid vanity merchant. All you do is strut about in front of a camera. You think you're some morally superior being, but you're not. I may be one rung above the scum of the earth, but I'm not the scum of the earth. I'll leave that to you and your kind. Derek began scraping the sauce from the bottom of his glass with an obnoxious and angry squeak. Anyway, Derek, I am not getting the house. Dawn is. Who is Dawn? Nigel's well-moistured face froze in a contorted and gelatinous grimace. Victoria's daughter. Kira was her guardian. How long were you with the woman for? Years, wasn't it? She absolutely adored Dawn. She spent all her free time with Dawn. At least she did when I was married to her. Or did you ban the friendship lest you ever be seen in the street with someone less than perfect? Derek shook his head and slumped back in his chair. He did vaguely remember this girl, Dawn, and he wondered what such a little imbecile could possibly do with such an important architectural piece as that huge and imposing Victorian home. All of its geographical accoutrements too. The tennis club, the Michelin-starred restaurants, the Thomas Pink, The John Lobb shoes, all those upmarket Wimbledon watering holes. Derek was sure that it would all be lost on such a dim-witted child with no sense for taste or luxury. What a waste, simmered Derek under his breath. By the by, Nigel announced, a friendly word of warning. You're not the only challenger to Kira's whopper of a house. You've a sparring partner, Victoria Burton Swift, quite the harridan. She's also been pestering Mr Crowther ceaselessly, and she's Dawn's mother, so I imagine she'll have first claim. For the first time, Derek began to wish he'd made the effort to pay more attention to the members of Kira's family. He'd been so very busy enjoying himself that it had never crossed his mind that all of that fun and all his freebies might one day come to an end. Derek began to wonder if this Victoria woman was single. Before you ask, you scoundrel, she's married. Her husband is still firmly clinging on to life. This coarse and improper turn in the conversation just confirmed to Derek how obscene all gay men were. So forward, so conniving, not to be trusted at all. Derek began to squirm in his chair. What on earth, he was beginning to think. What 
what in all God's greatness was he doing at this charity event? Who were these people? Why did they think he was remotely interested in the gays and their problems? Derek had to physically straighten himself to remember the important job in hand, to work on that wealthy woman, the one who'd invited him to this shit show in the first place. Where was she, by the way? And as Derek turned his back on Nigel, scanning all the female faces in the room, he set his sights on a secondary task, working on doors. Chapter 41. The Vulture. Victoria was mentally practicing what she was to say as she held the receiver to her ear, waiting to hear the psychiatrist's voice. Dr. Sophia Jones speaking. Her voice was the voice of earnestness. Ah, Dr. Jones, it's Victoria. Thank you for agreeing to talk. I know just how busy you are. Victoria was going to add something simpering like, a woman in command of her own existence, but she thought it was a tad too much. Mrs Burton Swift, yes. Oh, Victoria, please. Have you received my letters? Yes, Dr Jones, I have, and I'm afraid to say I'm a little concerned. Victoria was deliberately mirroring the psychiatrist's own choice of words. First of all, of course, about my little Dawn, referring to her aunt in murderous terms. I think you're right in your assessment that she feels quite a lot of anger at Kira for taking her own life. But there is another thing, and I hope you don't think I'm being overly concerned. Go on, please. You mentioned in your most recent missive this newfangled idea that Dawn has had. I'm afraid I think it's quite nonsense. About she and Etta living alone in the new house. This was brilliant, Victoria thought. She'd aligned herself so tightly with the good doctor's temperament that they'd become so very in tune. They were even beginning to finish each other's sentences. It's lovely that she feels so independent, Victoria went on, thanks to all your hard work and caring. And I'm very happy that Kira thought about my daughter in her will. But, you know, Victoria, I was thinking just the same thing. I'm not saying that Dawn's little project isn't impossible, but it is highly unusual for anyone with her condition to be living unsupervised. There is the option of a live-in carer, which I'm afraid I don't think I can afford. But I will say that I have made inquiries with all the school medical officers, and the consensus is that our residents are much better off living on school premises, indefinitely. I'm sorry to say it, but she's just not capable of living independently long term. Oh, said Victoria in her most simpering and sympathetic of tones. It's such a shame because I'm sure Dawn and Etta are having a lovely time making all their plans, dreaming up all sorts of scenarios. But I think you'll understand that I'm really concerned, Dr Jones, because Dawn is all that I've got. As on script as the psychiatrist was with Victoria, Dr Jones's swift and insightful reply came as quite a surprise. Have you ever thought, Victoria, of basing yourself over here, in the Wimbledon house? Victoria paused for a moment. She endeavoured to give a bashful flavour to her first reply. I am needed here, Dr Jones. My husband isn't well. She gave another pause, more ponderous and lengthy this time. But I have thought about, you know, flitting between the two, between Belfast and London. But the house is in Dawn's name and I wouldn't want to take that away from her. Well, began Dr Jones a little more hesitantly now. I know this might sound a bit harsh. Sometimes that's just the way of the medical world. But I do wonder if it is in Dawn's best interest that the house be kept in her name. You mean... Sign it over, for example, to me. Yes, that is what I mean, replied Dr. Jones quite plainly. Victoria couldn't quite believe her luck. She posed one last question just to make sure. The 
problem is, Doctor, that I don't think my Dawn really likes me. I don't think she'll want to sign over the property to me. Will that hinder the process at all? Dawn is on the verge of adulthood, so you will need my written authority to certify that she is not capable of owning any property, like a house. And that would assist any case of so-called power of attorney. Forgive me, I don't know if that's quite the right term. Yes, Victoria, that's it. Victoria's heart was racing. Maybe she wouldn't have to bother with Dawn at all. Maybe it would be a done deal before she'd even lifted a finger. The least work required, the better the outcome. That was Victoria's experience in life. The least meddling too. Occam's razor, she always thought. And this solution was quite the elegant one. Please, Dr. Jones, said Victoria before hanging up. We are doing the right thing, aren't we? It's all in Dawn's best interest, my dear. Just promise me you're looking after my Dawny. Victoria replaced the receiver. Her throat was all tight. Her heart was ringing in her ears. She let out a quiet yelp of glee. I've been thinking a lot this week about the Battenberg incident. It was brought again to my memory because I caught a little dyslexic boy cheating in my class. It did strike me that this boy, so sweet and generous and full of spirit, was compensating for something. The fact that his parents and his siblings always called him thick. I always find it sad when the children I teach are told that they are incapable. I wonder whether one becomes desperate to earn praise when one has not given enough of it as a child. Mummy and Daddy always gave me a lot of praise. I wonder if it wasn't a little too much. Praise in excess also does damage. It conditions you to expect it. You're always looking out for it, and when you don't get enough of it, you feel really quite depressed. I suppose that's why I still work, even though we don't need the money. I'm sure it's because I'm desperate to feel worthy of everyone else's praise. But the thing is, I'm finding I don't remember the parents giving Victoria, as a child, any praise at all. In fact, I can remember once overhearing Mummy talking to Grandma about how she was worried Victoria would end up a podgy disappointment. It was an incident that stuck with me because, for the parents, for Mummy in particular, being podgy was utterly unacceptable. I remember a time when I was 15 or 16 and I had to go to the dressmaker to get a skirt taken in. When the lady in the shop announced that I had a 23-inch waist, Mummy was strangely enthused. I'm sure she even yelped. She kept telling me how well I'd done and she bought me presents. But it was nothing to do with me. To be perfectly honest, Victoria was a bit large as a child. Not overweight at all. She just had a little bit of puppy fat. I can't help but wonder if that lowered her apparent value in the eyes of my competitive parents. I have no idea, of course, of how well Victoria did at school, another priority for my somewhat cutthroat mother. I was already at university by the time Victoria went to senior school, so what grades she received are utterly lost on me. Mummy never had a career. Mine and Victoria's generation was the first where school marks really counted for a woman. Mummy had the foresight to know that good looks and exquisite braiding wouldn't be enough for a woman in this modern world. But all this wondering about our childhood has brought upon me this nagging thought. There's this vague memory I have that Victoria killed my two pets, Mary and Martha, as a little girl. 
Isn't the act of killing innocent animals as a child the first sign of psychopathic tendencies? I could be imagining things, but I'm pretty sure those animals were poisoned. Perhaps I've consigned this memory to my unconscious, as the loss of Mary and Martha was just too painful to bear. When I allow myself to think about it, it's also very unsettling. I've always heeded Nigel's advice to leave it all in the past. What a pity that man's gay. But since the arrival of dawn in my life, I just can't help but wonder. Some of the parts were a mystery to both of them. Some of the parts they had to skip over because they were so complicated and long. But some other parts, Etta found she was able to explain to Dawn. The bit, for example, about the siblings not liking each other. She knew that Dawn was an only child, so she, of course, didn't have a clue. Etta compared what Dawn was reading to what she knew of her own father and her uncles. They were all siblings who hated each other. Uncle Timothy and Uncle George were very much loved by their parents, but her own father, Etta had heard, was a great big disappointment. He used to fight with his father just like Dawn's mother used to fight with her mother too. Etta knew that her daddy had some problems. He drank lots of whiskey and he poisoned himself with bad pills. He was sent to live in Australia. That's why Etta didn't see him anymore. He wrote her letters sometimes and she thought he was a nice man. But the way her grandparents and her uncles talked about him made it seem that he was responsible for everything bad that had happened to the family. Etta used to think to herself, why don't they just leave him alone? He's all the way over the other side of the world and he can't do anything bad to them these days. Even now when Daddy wasn't even in the house, everyone was always arguing about whose stuff was whose and who paid the bills and where people could park their tractors. Etta sometimes wondered about a word she once heard. She had heard it in church. It was in the Bible. The word was called scrapegoat. Etta could always remember the word because it sounded like grapes and scraping and her grandmother had goats and they scraped their hooves along the ground and sometimes she would feed grapes to them as well. That's how she remembered it. Etta thought her daddy was a scrapegoat. Maybe Dawn's mother was a scapegoat too. Etta asked Dawn a question. Did your grandparents tell your mummy that you'd come out wrong as a punishment? That's what my grandparents said to my daddy. I think your mummy's a scapegoat because I don't think anybody can be that much of an evil person. And everybody wants to pretend they're not evil. But everybody can be evil in their own way, you know. Etta knew all of this because when she read her books and did her research, She found out that so many people in the past, including people in her own family, did really terrible things. Her great-great-grandfather, who had built the Deauville house, didn't pay the builders any money. There were all these poor people who didn't have any money and he didn't give them enough food. He got lots of prizes from the King of England, but he didn't deserve them because he was a really bad man. Etta knew, though, that her great-great-grandfather lived all the way back in the past. It wasn't worth making a big scene about how nasty he was. It was time, she thought, to forgive him and forget him because he lived so many years ago. To keep remembering all these nasty things and people was just plain bad for you. But Etta's friend Dawn wasn't forgiving and forgetting. It was clear to Etta that her friend wasn't convinced by this scapegoat idea at all. It was beginning to cross Etta's mind that Dawn had it in for her mother. Maybe she was still upset that her mummy had sent her away and hadn't given her any birthday presents over the years. But Dawn said that it wasn't anything to do with birthday presents. She said that she could get as many birthday presents from her mother as she could possibly post. But Dawn would still always know that her nasty mummy was capable of really hideous things. Chapter 
1944, the Sparrowhawk. Geoffrey had received the letter over a week ago. It was the nurse who read it out to him. The words had floated through the thick air of his bedroom in a vague cloud of noise and meaning. Geoffrey didn't know at first if he'd heard the story correctly. He didn't know if the incident was true or if it was a dream. Surely it was an occurrence too hideous to take place in the monotonous grounds of reality. That his beautiful Kira had gone and that Victoria had informed him in writing of a tone so distasteful, it seemed in Geoffrey's shimmered understanding that she was almost enjoying the fact. The news had set Geoffrey on a renewed course of thinking, but to think was nothing short of agony for the man, because he was having all these ideas, these painful and twisted ideas. Ideas of horror and nastiness that, frustratingly, he couldn't share with the police. One close relation to Victoria, he thought, a casualty in suspicious circumstances, might be an accident. But two had to be more than a coincidence. They were saying that Kira's death was a suicide. But the Kira Geoffrey knew was a happy woman, a determined woman, a woman full of joy and love and life. Geoffrey could hardly bear his life anymore. The humiliations of being incapable of caring for himself. The daytime television that droned on in the background, full of garish presenters with false smiles and heavy makeup. The hideous food they served in here. The fact that he couldn't walk outside or talk. The fact that he was lonely. He was sure that if Dawn were able, she'd come and visit him every day. She'd phone him up, ask him how he was. But she couldn't and he was sure that Victoria had given special instruction to the school that they were never to see each other again. Geoffrey had long got used to disappointments in his life. It seemed that his life had lived up to the mythic cliché his mother used to recite. It had become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. She would always say, growing up, that life was full of disappointment. And since that night with Victoria when his fate was sealed, Geoffrey's life had been nothing short of miserable. That hideous saying would make his toes curl as a young man. His life seemed, at that time, to be unfolding before him in a wide vista of bright and brilliant opportunity. He could never imagine how bad it would possibly get. But Geoffrey found that he was losing the will to care. There was only one thing, one person he could allow himself to care about. That person was Dawn. But he was beginning to fear that Victoria might harm her too. Her third victim a triptych of wasted life, the poison finger touching all those around her. Geoffrey wanted so desperately to be able to warn his child. lots of people who had them. They've got lots of energy and they are very friendly. They always look like they're smiling at you. Have you ever thought of writing to your mother and telling her that you like Labradors? Why would I do that? She's not interested in what I like. Oh Dawn, I'm afraid you really don't know your mother at all. Dawn was so used to trusting Dr Jones, to hanging on to her every word, that she wasn't sure now if she'd been wrong about her mother if she really did know her mother, or if she didn't. It was true that she didn't see much of her mum, that she only went on the occasional trip home. 
Dawn knew her Auntie Kira much, much better than her mummy. Dr. Jones knew Auntie Kira much, much better than her mummy. Dr. Jones knew people inside out. That was her job. She looked into people's brains and organised them. Maybe she'd seen inside Mummy's brain, and maybe it wasn't all that bad. But Auntie Kira still hadn't come home, and Dawn was sure that Mummy was hiding her. There's a memorial service for your auntie this weekend. What's one of those? Dr. Jones explained that it was a big party where everyone who knew a person who had passed away came together to celebrate their life. Dawn wasn't sure what passed away meant. Auntie Kira had gone away, somewhere, and she did have a life worth celebrating. Dawn hoped that Auntie Kira would come to the party too. Your mother's going to be there. Isn't that nice? We're all going to have a meeting together because there are some grown-up things we need to sort out. Dawn was excited about being a grown-up. She was going to be a grown-up in just a few weeks. And she couldn't wait to move into that big house in Wimbledon with Etta and with Auntie Kira just when she decided to come home. December 1972. Nigel gave me a lovely string of pearls for Christmas. I should be very grateful. I should be happy and pleased. But I've been awake since four o'clock this morning because I cannot sleep. I've had a terrible nightmare. The frightening thing is, I don't think the nightmare was a mere projection of my imagination. I think the nightmare was real. It's 1950, the summer holidays. I'm 14. Victoria's six. Mummy has sent us into town on the bus with a set of pearls she wants restrung. I'm holding Victoria's hand. The pearls are in my purse. But when I arrive at the jeweller's, I realise that I've left my purse on the bus. I rush back to the station, Victoria clinging to my fingers. The bus is searched. The purse has been stolen. I dare not tell the adults what's to be found inside because I know they will alert my parents and the police. I tell the bus driver that it only contains a little bit of pocket money. We take the bus back home. I blame the loss of pearls on Victoria, tell my parents that she dropped them down a drain. My parents are incredibly angry with her. She is punished, sent away to bed. Father says she is not to be allowed any confectionery for a month. I am praised for my honesty at telling the parents what happened as soon as I arrived home. I am called a very grown-up young lady. I am told I am responsible. Victoria is told she is a nasty little girl. The next day is a Sunday. At church, the parents tell the vicar what happened the day before. They ask for Victoria to be taken aside and admonished because they feel their own authority is not enough to discipline this rascal girl. At Sunday lunch, grandma and grandfather and my aunts, uncles and cousins are informed of the naughty and irresponsible little girl's behaviour. Grandma nearly faints with rage. Those pearls were once hers, and her own mother's too, a grand dame of Belfast who survived the sinking of the Titanic. I remain silent. I feel only a whisper of guilt. Little Victoria only briefly cries. Her confusion at the course of the events is too fierce to be overwhelmed by tears of anger or shame. I, the young girl, who cannot bear be anything other than perfect, have poisoned my sister and poison my parents' perception of her. They begin to treat her differently. Victoria begins to live up to her nasty little name.